Thank you. Thank you. To be fair, the blog posts are turning towards the crimes against Go, but yes, thanks. Okay. But yeah, no, today we're indeed here to talk about profiling. And profiling is about making your programs go fast. And of course, you want your programs to go fast, right? You care about performance. You said no, you can leave. <laughs> But to, to know how to get, uh, make a program fast, we need to first define what we consider fast. So this might uh, feel a bit uh, philosophical, but we need to know our target before we optimize for it. So in terms of, in abstract, we probably know what we mean for fast, but let's see a few, uh, a few examples. There are cases that are pretty straightforward, a fast hash, to go into crypto is something that can hash many megabytes per second. And that's, that's clear, that's it. You measure that. Just like a fast regex engine is one that can process, that can match a lot of uh, data very fast. Uh, again, megabytes per second, gigabytes per second. So far, so good. And a fast database is one that can store, retrieve, process, again, a lot of data uh, in, in a short amount of time. But a fast database can also be one that takes very little time to answer to your queries, that returns in a few milliseconds every time you query it. This gets even more clear when we talk about a website. A fast website is either a performant website can be both one that can handle a lot of uh, requests at the same time, or one that uh, can load fast, that is snappy, that takes a few uh, milliseconds to send you the HTML page. Same thing for an API. It can be one that can handle many clients at the same time, or, or and or, one that can return very fast every time you query it. So fast is both throughput and latency. There are two sides to it. And throughput is what is usually easier to measure, while latency is often what we are more interested in. And I say we to talk about the Go community in general, because sometimes this is a trade-off between throughput and latency. And one that you might be aware of is the garbage collection times. In the, in the Go runtime, the garbage collection times have gone lower and lower to the point that in Go 1.9, even with gigantic heaps, you almost can't notice them in most services. However, to do that, the garbage collector is now doing a lot of work parallelly, like it's doing a lot of work while your uh, program executes, and it doesn't have to stop the world to do most of that work. That, of course, has a throughput cost, because if you just have that much CPU, some of those operations will take a bit of that CPU time, and it's less efficient to do it parallelly than it would be to do it stopping the world. So this is a trade-off between throughput and latency. Usually we make network services, so we care about latency, and indeed the Go uh, team recognizes that and optimized aggressively for latency. Depending on the workloads, there have been mm, people seeing two, three percent slowdowns in terms of throughput because of the same garbage collection optimizations. So when we talk about fast and throughput and measuring, of course, we think about profiling. And Go helps us out here, because the CPU profiler is very easy to use. You might have used it already. If you have tests, you just have to add dash CPU profile. And if you have a service running, you can just import net HTTP pprof, and then you hit that endpoint, debug slash pprof slash profile, and you have a CPU profile, 30 seconds. So that's very well integrated, and usually, uh, what you learn about when you start learning about how to, profile, how to profile, how to optimize your programs. But let, to, understand, to understand how we approach latency instead, we need to understand how the profiler works. So CPU profiling revolves around SIGPROF. SIGPROF is a signal from the kernel, just like SIGINT that you use when you want to shut down a service cleanly, or SIGTERM, which doesn't even reach the application, just kills the application. These are all kernel signals. But SIGPROF is not sent manually every time. 
SIGPROF is something that your application asks the kernel to send at a fixed interval and in a number of hertz, like how many times a second it sends the same signal. And then it's not your application to handle it, but directly the, the runtime. It has a handler for SIGPROF directly in the Go runtime. And every time it receives it, it executes this without waking your application. And what that does is that it looks at the, it looks at the stack. It figures out what function is running at that given time when the uh, signal hit on the CPU. And it records the stack trace. So all the functions that called this function. And it writes it down in pprof format in a buffer so that then you can retrieve that profile. So far so good? Okay, you can control, by the way, that period to have uh, more fine-grained or coarse and lower performance cost, of course, um, using the runtime package. Runtime has, I think, set CPU profile rate um, that you can use. Now, let's imagine an HTTP server, okay, the API server that you might be uh, implementing. And let's say that it has four requests uh, in flight at the same time. And they're all handled by the same uh, function, the same handler, and they're running on a single CPU, because maybe our machine has only one CPU available for our server. So what happens is that they get in in a certain order, the first one starts executing on the CPU, and then let's imagine that there is some input output involved in generating the response. This is not unusual, like you might need to contact a database, uh, call out to a microservice somewhere. So you often do input-output uh, while serving a request. How we do it in Go, the beauty of its concurrency uh, paradigm is that we don't really care what happens while we are blocking, right? We just call the function http.get and wait for it to return, and when it returns, we carry on. That's because the scheduler is there to hide that complexity from us. What the scheduler will do is that we'll let the first uh, go routine handle the request. And then when that go routine blocks on I.O. and yields to the scheduler, the scheduler goes, takes that go routine out of the CPU, takes another go routine that is waiting to execute, maybe one that uh, is there to accept a request, and schedules it on that CPU. And again, for each of the four requests. Then at some point, one of those I.O. operations finishes. So the kernel lets the Go scheduler know, hey, this thing was waiting on this file descriptor, it was waiting on this uh, HTTP request to start producing output from this microservice. It's ready. So that's flagged as runnable. That Go routine is ready again to be executed. So it takes it, and as soon as it has time, for example, because something else has finished, it schedules it on the CPU. So this is the Go scheduler. It's amazing because it allows you to have similar performance to that of uh, highly optimized applications like Nginx without really worrying about it. Nginx has a stunning state-of-the-art event loop, which what it does is it processes each event, and every time it has to block, it puts it back into a queue, loops again, picks another uh, things from the, uh, from the queue. Now, that's essentially the same thing at the end of the day, but in that case, you have to handle it yourself. Instead, in Go, we just do it like this. So let's see how CPU profiling works with this kind of scheduling on a single CPU. We said that CPU profiling is just, in real world time, approximately, just a fixed period at which a signal is received, the word stops, the, uh, the Go runtime goes looking at what it was doing, on that CPU, and it writes down that stack trace, and then carries on. So of course, what will happen is that it will sample all those processing we do before and after the I.O. But during the I.O., that go routine will be removed from the CPU. It will not be running on the CPU because something else is running. So that will be completely invisible to the CPU profiler. You see why? The CPU profiler will only take samples of what's happening on the processor, 
But when your GoRoutine is just waiting for the microservice to, or the database to send back an answer, it's not keeping the CPU busy because it's pointless. It's just waiting. It's just blocking. So instead, something else is running there. So if you run the CPU profiler, you would only sample, you would only see those functions that actually use the CPU. But actually, what we would observe when you measure with like time, in time of milliseconds, how fast your API is, is the whole time that that took. This, the processing before, the entire I.O. that is invisible to the CPU profiler, and then the processing that happens after. So this is the discrepancy between throughput, CPU profiling, and latency profiling. Now, let's go for more concrete examples. Let's say that there is a, a, a HTTP handler that executes a couple functions to serve your request. It has a write function that writes a few files on disk, maybe log files. And then it has a hash function that hashes a bunch of data. Very simple. This is the code. It's just calling you know, temp file, uh, clo uh, write, close, remove, and SHA-256 sum. It calls them both when receiving a HTTP request to serve each request. Let's go to our uh, profiler, because we see that this takes approximately 10 seconds. We decide that 10 seconds for a request is too much. And so, of course, we don't start optimizing without profiling, right? So, of course, we go to the profiler, and we try to find the bottleneck before we start profiling, before we start optimizing. So we run the... Uh, maybe dash CPU profile, or we use the net HTTP pprof endpoint, whichever way you prefer to obtain a CPU profile, and we run go tool pprof. And this is what we see. There's a lot going on, like, no need to look at all the details, but the big thing here is that sha256.block function. It's taking 80% of the time spent by this server, uh, this server doing things. So that's our bottleneck, right? That's what we need to optimize out. This is the normal workflow. So we optimize it out. Maybe we, I don't know, rewrite the API uh, so that it doesn't require the hash at all. I don't know. Somehow, we go in there, we remove that uh, hash call, and now we expect it to be fast. We're satisfied. We profiled. It was not premature optimization. We did our job. We run time curl again. And what happens? We only shaved off a couple seconds. It's still taking 7.5 seconds. Why? We removed something that uh, was taking 80% of the CPU time. How, how is it that it didn't go down by 80%? Well, a lot of the time was invisible to the CPU profiler, because a lot of the time was spent blocking. Latency is not all about what happens on the CPU. There is more, and there is all the time spent on blocking. If you, uh, your task was actually CPU bound, if it was actually slowed down by how much the CPU is used, you'd see spikes of 100% of CPU. And that usually doesn't happen on almost any even well-optimized service I've seen. So in a world where CPUs are not getting faster, and if you uh, buy a faster CPU, a faster machine, it will only have more CPUs, and where you can easily horizontally scale, optimizing for CPU is getting less and less relevant, because sometimes you can just throw more machines at it, because you'll have more CPU, and if that's what was slowing you down, you can throw money at the problem. Sometimes you don't want to, but... The problem is that you can't do that for latency. If what's slowing you down is blocking at the file um, network synchronization level, you can't just throw a bigger machine to it. So CPU profiling is for throughput, is for how much data we can process, for hash functions, for regex functions. But for latency profiling, like when you want your API to return in 10 milliseconds tops, 95 percentile, 15 milliseconds, something like that, 
you need the tracer. The tracer is a new tool in Go 1.5, I believe, that allows you to look instead at all these blocking events that take time and not CPU. So we can use the, the tracer to generate a profile just like the CPU one. We'll see how. But let's see again our write no hash um, um, HTTP request uh, under the lens of the tracer instead of under the lens of the CPU profiler. This is what we see instead. Completely different picture from the CPU profile. Most of the time, three seconds are spent entirely on syscall.close, which is kind of weird. If, like, why are we spending all our time closing files? Well, this is where we dig into maybe even kernel internals, and we learn that the kernel will buffer writes. So when you actually call write, most of the times nothing happens yet. It just gets written to a buffer. And then when you call close, which is why it's important to call close before your application dies, uh, it will actually flush the buffer to disk and wait for the disk to acknowledge the write. And that takes time. That takes milliseconds. That takes actual wall clock time blocking. So this already told us what a possible solution could be. We were writing 50 files. Maybe we can just write one concatenated file with an index, maybe, and only close once. That way, we make more use of those buffers with bigger amounts of data that go into the buffers. And maybe that way, we can optimize out much more time than we could have with CPU profiling. So I skipped over the, how you actually use the trace. So how, how did we generate that uh, tracing profile? Well, the tracer at its core is a feature of the runtime that will write a nanosecond level log of all these events that happen in your application. It's integrated in the scheduler, and every time that the scheduler will take your routine out of the CPU, because it's blocking on, for example, file.close, and put something else on it, it will write down in a compact binary format, I just took out this function from this routine, and for this reason waiting on a, on a file. And it will also keep track of everything from network, um, all the syscall garbage collection events, and events about the goroutines themselves. This goroutine started this older goroutine. So you have a lot of data to see how everything is happening. As well as, of course, locking like mutexes, channels, scheduling overhead itself. The resulting log files are pretty big because of course, you're writing hundreds of events for each request, maybe, even thousands. So sometimes you have to run it for just a couple of seconds to get multiple tens of gigabytes from a production server. But you can run in production because it has an overhead of about 25%. Your program gets slower because, of course, every time it does something, it's also taking a note about having done something. But it's in the ballpark of something that you can tolerate for a few seconds on a production server. Before Go 1.7, it was like four times slower. And finally, the symbols, so the actual names of the functions, are embedded in the result. So you don't have to keep track of your uh, test binary uh, or grab the binary from production to then visualize this data. As opposed to the, to the profile, the trace has a full context about the event. It doesn't just tell you that at that time, I looked at what was running on the CPU and was this function. It tells you how we got there, what GoRoutine is running. It tells you each event, how long it took, like it blocked on a file.close for this amount of time. It gives you all the metadata and the history about the GoRoutine itself, so you can know who created that GoRoutine and from what function that GoRoutine was created. And all, we'll see how all this data uh, comes in handy. But most importantly, what is very different from CPU profiling is that these are discrete events. 
So while CPU profiling makes sampling, so every time it just looks at a sampled view, and it wouldn't be able to notice that in this case there are three, six, nine executions of that function, but one much longer than the others. As far as the sampling is concerned, it just sampled that function 20 times. If you somehow know that you called that function nine times, which the CPU profiler doesn't even tell you, if you knew because, I don't know, you're profiling a test that you know runs the function nine times, you would only know that approximately it sampled 2.2 times each execution. But that's not as useful as knowing that this function is sometimes very slow, but most of the times very fast. This is how we get bad 95 percentiles, even when the mean is good. The tracer does not have this problem, because the tracer for each event, for every time a file.close uh, happens, a file.write, uh, read from network happens, it records when it started and when it finished, with a nanosecond timestamp. So every time you know how long each event took, discrete events, bigger log files, much more context, much more possibilities of what you can visualize. So how do we generate in practice these traces? You can either import runtime trace and start the tracing manually and stop the tracing manually. It takes a io.writer. Or you can import again that package net prof and use the trace endpoint. You can pass a number of seconds so that it doesn't uh, dump on you some 50 gigabytes of, da of data. It even takes a fractional seconds, and it was actually useful in some services. But what you get is the entire log that we spoke about. And then it has an integrated UI, which, to be honest, looks pretty intimidating. It's a lot of data. It's pretty useful to be able to read it, and there was this very good uh, talk at GopherCon this year about using this UI. But honestly, I always, it always felt a bit too much for what I needed to know. I only need to know what operations were slow, and most of the times, not all these details about all the GoRoutine scheduling. So instead, I went into the, the code base and standard library, and I added a way to export pprof files, just like the ones for CPU profiling, but generated not from the CPU profiling data, but from the tracing data, and offer from different types of tracing data. This is merging Go 1.8, so given a, a trace log file, you can go there and use Go Tool Trace, and with Go Tool Trace, you can export a peeper of file that you can visualize with any tool you want. So you export the syscall uh, type trace, which is what we looked at when we are seeing that file.close, and then you run your usual go tool pprof. And that's exactly what I did to generate that slide where we've seen syscall.close being big and taking a long time. But if you prefer flame graphs, you could run go torch on it because it's the same format as the blocking profile and similar to the CPU profile. And that would generate a flame graph that looks like this, and again, has syscall.close dominating the, the execution time. So this is not what runs off the CPU, but the exact opposite, what keeps things from running on the CPU and keeps them waiting, blocking, and slowing down your clients. So this was uh, the type syscall, people of, uh, equals syscall, which indeed can identify things like this, where you're writing to a file, where you're reading something from disk, anything that you're doing that takes time that involves the kernel doing things from you, system calls. The next one we, uh, I'd like to look at is the sync type. The sync type is similar in output to the blocking profile. I don't know if anyone has ever used that. I've almost never seen the blocking profile used. Yeah. So that has been supported for longer, uh, way longer time, and it works like the CPU profile. It's 
sitting just next to it. But this is much more precise, and it comes directly from the tracer, and again, is not aggregated data, but discrete events. It detects things like this, where we have a wait on a channel for some time. Here, for example, because we are waiting for a timer. So let's try again inserting this function in a bigger program and running it under the tracer. Indeed, we see our serve HTTP request, where the request was handled, our slow handler, which is where I call the block function, main.block that takes exactly 1,001 milliseconds. This is another thing that is different from CPU profiling. These are actual wall clock times. So that's one millisecond that was spent by a goroutine blocking on that, not serving a request. And that whole time was spent on channel receive, blocking, waiting to receive something from a channel, because that's what our code was doing. But interestingly, it's not the only thing that is blocking, and I did not expect at first to, for anything else than block to show up here. But a different function that I call is showing up. It's called uh, main.download. It's just a download from somewhere, HTTP get. Why is it showing up in a blocking profile? Well, it turns out that this is a HTTP2 request, as we can see somewhere in the stack trace. But what is interesting about indeed HTTP2 requests, is that they allow you to parallelize, pretty much, to, um, to send multiple requests over the same connection. So how does Go handle that? Well, this trace tells us that it starts a separate Go routine to do the actual network, and then to do the HTTP request, it just blocks on that network Go routine, waiting it f for it to actually deliver the data. So let, let's look at how the download function looks like then. The download function is exactly what you would expect. HTTP.get and read all from any URL. I used the, uh, a Go doc. Now, of course, we learned that it has some time spent in synchronization, blocking, waiting for channels to unblock. But of course, it will also spend some time on network. The net type is a separate type in the tracer, because in Go, there is a separate thread that waits for network events to happen. It uses, usually, um, kernel-level systems like EPOL, so that it can wait for all your connections at the same time in the same thread, without having one thread for each connection. So if we look at the structure, of course, I don't expect you to read that. But if we look at the structure of the, of the profile, there are two main columns. There are two main blocking. One column, if we focus in, is accepting. Now, this teaches us something about the, uh, the tracing profile in general. Not everything that shows up in there is something that we need to optimize out. This just tells us that our server blocks waiting to accept new requests. Well, of course, there will always be one Go routine that is waiting for new requests to come in to start a new Go routine to actually handle them. That will block forever. This is 1.15 uh, minutes, but that's only because I run my experiment for one minute. If you run your server for two hours, you will see two hours. Because this Go routine will always be waiting on accepting for the next request to come in. So that's blocking that doesn't actually slow down our clients. So reading a tracing profile requires some more focusing. And indeed, if we look at the order column instead, that one starts from HTTP2 client con dot read loop. Now, read loop is exactly the function that reads our data from the HTTPS connection to the Go server. Now, to the uh, golang.org server. Now, that one indeed blocks on net.read. So that's the time that we spend blocking downloading things. 
that's instead time that we could optimize if we cache the file or something like that. That's all time that our client spent blocking before returning from our slow handler. However, th there is another lesson here. There is double counting. Because this time is counted both in network and in blocking. Because there are two goroutines, and they're both waiting for the file to be downloaded. When the file is downloaded, this one will wake up, and then it will wake up the other goroutine to let it know that it's, the data is ready. So again, the tracer helps us understand what's happening, not necessarily measure in terms of precise numbers how much faster we made something. The percentages might not matter as much. So a, big, a small problem we have with this one is that it starts at the top at HTTP2 client con read loop. But what called read loop? How do we know what is the function that is low? This is a simple example, so we know it's main.download. But how would we figure that out? The problem here is that this is a new go routine. This is spawned with probably go read loop. And that means that the stack doesn't go to whatever called it. However, in the trace log, we know we have the event of creating a goroutine, if you remember. We have all the metadata about all the goroutines. So if we try to focus this naively by using the dash focus flag to only see things that happen under you know, slow handler, because that's the handler we're trying to look at, accept will disappear, which is good. But also this will disappear because it's in a different goroutine. Now, something nice that we can do with this data is that it's not that hard to convert post-process the log, row log itself, into these pprofs. This is the entire code in the standard library that generates that, uh, that network blocking pprof. It makes a, a loop over the events, which are just these discrete events. This happened. I started blocking. If the type is not a blocking on network something, it skips, because we are only interested in network blocking here. Then it obtains the stack trace of the event. And in the pprof result, it flags it as, OK, this happened one more time, n++. And the total time spent on this stack, which in this case would be the stack that goes through um, read that goes through read loop all the way down to network.read. It took this amount of time. So it just records that, adds to the total amount of time that that stack took, the time of this event. That's the entire code that generates those traces. Now, since we also have the events that create the go routines, what we can do is write a tool where we say, I'm interested in everything that happens under survey HTTP, including all the go routines that are created under survey HTTP. So if we run this code, all this is doing is selecting the go create, the new uh, go routine creation events, and color coloring a tree. I don't have a formal CS background, but uh, those who uh, do might remember like tree coloring starting from the, the parent. So we take everything that is created, all the routines created under a stack that, calls, that was called by survey HTTP, and we flag them. We just sa save them in a map. And then later, when we select for events, we select both all those events invoked directly by the survey HTTP or by any of these go routines that were started by survey HTTP. Now, of course, said in two minutes, this might seem a bit more complex than it is, but it's just, at the end of the day, 15 lines that we can just add to the current tooling, just really copy-pasted it, and isolate maybe the, the, the library from inside the, the standard library, and we have a new uh, tool. Trace focus. I did this as a proof of concept, but it's out there, it's on GitHub, and it works. 
what you can do is trace focus with filter survey HTTP and give it, give it a log and it will generate a pprof. And this time it will not have accept. This time it will only have the read loop. And since it doesn't have accept, it will not filter out smaller things. So for example, it surfaced that some blocking is also done by getcon. So of course, making a HTTP connection doesn't only involve reading, but also opening that connection at the beginning. But we were missing that because we were not focusing on it. And these two are completely separate at the top because indeed they are started in different goroutines. But since they all trace back to serve HTTP and we had the data to show that, here they are in the trace. Now it's very hard to make a universal tool because you might not care about things uh, that happen in the deeper goroutines. You might want to filter out some goroutines, but all the data is there. And a lot of the times you can optimize it for your specific application. What I really want to happen here is for an ecosystem of tools to start developing on top of this tracing data. This is a gold mine of information about everything that your program did and everything that caused the latency. So, for example, exa ideas for tools would be to focus on goroutine numbers. You might tag all your requests, maybe send it in a HTTP header or write it in a log file. It's goroutine ID. And when, once you have the ID, you might want to focus on that goroutine so that you can see why that request was low. Or you might want to aggregate them all, even if there is some double counting, maybe doing something smart to hide this double counting so that you have a complete vision of all the things that slow you down. You might want to do different visualizations, something better than these black and white boxes dot style. One that I went for uh, as a second proof of concept is instead generating a histogram. Because again, one of the most important things here is that it's not just average of how long it takes, but it has the complete events of each execution. And it can tell us that, for example, syscall.close most of the times takes between 100 and 130 milliseconds. But there are cases in which it takes up to 255. That's not that much of an outlier. But there are things that will have very high spikes at the bottom. And that would tell you where your 99 percentile is going. So yes, please go and build more tools that build on top of this. In the GitHub repo, you will find the library you read to import and some examples already. And yeah, profile latency, not just CPU. Any questions? No questions out there? I can't actually see. <laughs> can't either. No? All right, let's give Filippo a big hand. Thanks, Filippo. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.